Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully you all can hear me. Uh, my name is Lucas Haley. Um, I am a board member of NZGDA, uh, and I'm helping to coordinate um, the Kiwi Game Starter Competition. Um, and as part of that, hopefully you guys are, are getting your packages together, your submission packages. Uh, and part of that is, is um, there's a section on marketing. Um, and it's, it's the section that I've probably received the most questions about. Um, so I thought it might be kind of a cool idea uh, to get someone in to talk a little bit about marketing. Um, and what, what sort of steps would be good to get started and where you should kind of be aiming your work um, so that you can have the strongest application possible uh, for the competition. Um, so Jean Leggett is going to be joining us from Canada. Uh, she has an extensive uh, resume of game development work and, and um, marketing and production. Uh, and uh, so she is going to be talking to us about different ways or different approaches uh, to get started on marketing. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Jean. Uh, Jean will be talking for a bit and hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, but I can't imagine this is going to be going on for longer than 40 minutes, an hour. So um, you guys can, if you need to get back to work, you can get back to work. All right. All right. Thank you very Hello. much, Jean. Hello, everybody. Everybody can hear me. Oh, and I see that my auto captioning on Microsoft PowerPoint is working. So if you need it, it is there, which is super fantastic. If you have questions for me afterwards, feel free to email me, drop me a line on Twitter, I'm very accessible. But my job is to talk a little bit about marketing and market research. Um, and I will give you my bona fides so that you understand where I'm coming from. I just recently stepped down as the CEO of One More Story Games, but I filled that role for eight years and founded an indie game studio and still actively involved in the studio, but in a different capacity. And in that, I have also professionally been a career and leadership development coach and business coach for over 500 people in games in the last two and a half years. I've raised $500,000 from what they call friends, family, and fools. And I have also raised over $250,000 in grants. There are specific tax grants that are available to Canadian game development companies. So we've been able to tap into those and also through arts funding type organizations. Further to that, I write games. I've been the lead writer on a big deal game, which uh, has its own little story and history. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about starting your own company and the experiences of what that's like, I highly recommend my podcast. I hear it's really good. It's called Games, Grit, and Gratitude. And it really is like life coaching meets game dev. And what I want to specifically point out is there's episodes three and four that are specifically about setting your vision as a business owner and what your vision is for your game. So there's worksheets attached to the podcast. Go check that out. All right, so in terms of setting the expectations for this talk, I have not timed this talk and I talk at a decent pace, so we should have lots of time left over for, talk, for questions. But really what it is that I wanna help you do is get clear on what it is that you have in your hands that you want other people to see. Get ready for grant applications, maybe get some clarity so that when you're going to do your publisher pitches, it is pristine and clean and concise because a confused mind never buys. You'll hear me say that once or twice during this talk. So we will be going through a little bit of the, the why, who, what, where, how, when, um, and sort of like tempering your expectations around all of this. We will not be getting into pitch decks. I do have a resource page at the very end and we will not be getting into specific marketing strategies, but I have resources for you as well, okay? So before we get started, I always like to start with this page almost every presentation because sometimes people will see this and they will feel overwhelmed. They will feel stressed, they will feel anxious. Those are normal feelings. And there's a reason why there are people out there who have expertise that are willing to connect with you and give you their expertise. So you might be like, oh my God, they really know what they're doing. Guess what? When they first started doing something, they were clearly, you know, they felt overwhelmed too. 
if you ask anybody who's ever started a new thing, they have felt overwhelmed at one point. So please understand that. And also you might be looking at other people's gains and seeing that they're more successful or their team seems to know what they're doing. There are lots of factors that impact how a team or a project does. That might be the, the when they were discovered, they may have had resources that you don't know about. Um, there's lots of things. So let us not compare ourselves to other people and let's just jump right in. So this whole thing, um, for me, everything in the world worth communicating has to be communicated well. So some of you might know me as like the career coach of game devs. I've, like I said, I've coached over 500 people in game devs. And this, I actually help people with what's called career branding, right? I'm just helping them package and get more clear on how they sell themselves as game developers. This marketing talk is about how you sell your games or your company's vision. So when we are clear, it is easier for people to understand and buy into our goals as a studio or as a project, our desired outcomes. And if we can clearly state what it is that we need from other people, they will better understand their contribution. How can they help us? And there you go, a confused mind never buys. So I want clarity equals cash to become your mantra. Listen, I am as left as they come. I'm a socialist. I'm like tax all the people and share all the wealth. Cash has like negative connotations for me, but that's not what this is about. Clarity equals buy-in. So if you feel very scattered or frenetic in your messaging, it comes off. So if we can get super clear, we're gonna talk a little bit about clarity, it will go a really long way. So why are we even talking about this? Well, I hate to break it to you. Not only are you a game developer with an idea, but you're actually now supposed to be a business owner. And this is where most people fail. Money makes the world go round. Money pays for rent, groceries, utilities, student loans, credit cards, families, right? We need, everything is built around money. So when we're talking about funding opportunities, most funding opportunities come with strings attached now. Kiwi starter grant, not the same kind of strings attached, but like super big grants or publisher grants, they want to see a return on their investment. You need to make a viable business case for them to see where they will get their return, their profitability. Um, we're going to talk about what that means. Um, very rare do you actually get access to resources or grants where all they want is for you to undertake something specifically for you to develop skills or make prototypes. But those things do exist out there. NZ Code is a really great example of a funding body that wants to give you money so that you can cut your teeth on game making. Most places want, excuse me, I have a little bit of a cough. Most places want a business case for success. They already expect you to have a vertical slice of your game. I didn't even know what vertical slice was um, until a couple of years into my studio because it was terminology I didn't know. Go Google it, you know, look up vert vertical slice video game and you'll find all of the things that are the components of it. They want to see audience engagement. They literally want to see is your game going to be successful before you've even made it, which can be really frustrating because you feel like you need the resources to make it successful and it's very chicken and egg. As we dive deeper into understanding your audience and your market research, when you start to understand your business better, that allows you to plan out the timeline. You know, are you making a short game? Are you making a long game? What is your staffing needs? And I'll tell you this as somebody who had varying degrees of success with their game. Like we got a number one New York Times bestseller to come and work with us. Um, we partnered with her. We're still making a game with her. And that was really great. I won three Canada Game of the Year awards and they're really great games, but nobody played them. So just because you have high accolades and achievements doesn't mean that you're going to success, succeed at the business piece of it. 
You need to know how long are things going to take, um, how much are things going to cost, double the time, triple the time for your development, especially if you're a new studio, because we all have a tendency to underestimate things because we don't have the experience. Also, I just wanted to like highlight, there's something on there called founder fatigue. This is a very real thing that happens. So once you get into operating your game development business, you start talking to other founders, like on social media, you're like, oh, they look so successful. And you talk to them privately and they're like, oh my God, I can't sleep, I have insomnia. Payroll talk has become payroll talk. I'm like, yes, because you're running a business. So listen, I wish that we could all make games for art. We do not have that luxury. Um, we got to make games for money. So how do we make money? Well, clarity. Clarity in, in this case, in this in the Kiwi Starter Grant application and other applications is understanding your players, right? You need to definitively show that you understand your target audience. I have specific strategies for you threat assessment, that you understand the competitive landscape. It is a key component of your application. Execution, this is how you are going to deliver on your communication strategy, your community engagement strategy, your PR. Um, all of this means that you can show how you sell yourself. Listen, do I say listen a lot? I'm gonna have to review the tape on that one. Here's the thing, selling yourself feels awkward. If I could be like, hey, show me, show me a hand, show your hands if you, if you feel awkward about selling yourself, it is, it is a very challenging thing to do. And getting more comfortable with your market research, maybe you think less of like, hey, I have to sell myself, but I'm selling my game and I really love my game. Thanks, Lucas, see, he's got his hand up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I see those hands. So how many of you, <laughs> how many of you, when asked who will play your game, have said, all the players, all the players will play my game? This, in fact, dear readers, is not true. Okay, this comes from inexperience, and I have been there too. One of the cool things about what I'm doing with One More Story Games now is we are completely starting from scratch eight years later, and we are going through all the market research and um, stress testing with our users and doing all of this really cool stuff because we want to reconnect with our users eight years later. This is not for all of the players. So challenging your assumptions. You might be like, well, um, our players are 18 year old boys who really love Hades. And I'm like, okay, so how did you come to that conclusion? Well, I just know. That's not gonna fly with a publisher or a grants body. They wanna see that you've done at least a little bit of research to figure out who are your players. So, that is things like the demographics. What are they playing? Do they watch television? Are they reading interesting books? Are, what social platforms are they on? What are What is their level of social engagement? Where do they find out about games? How much money do they spend on games? Where in the world do they live? All of these pieces of information help us form a picture of our target audience. Um, that allows us to determine where should we spend our money? So for example, and I have more examples later, but if your target audience, you find out, tends to skew, let's say, I'm 45. I'm 45, I'm a female, and I live in Canada. My primary language is English. I spend a lot of time on TikTok. So I think TikTok would be an ideal place for you to advertise a game if I was your intended targeted audience, right? Um, if your target audience is, I don't know, 23 year old, 23 year old German boys or uh, young men, then maybe you're advertising or doing a lot of like Reddit promos or YouTube videos, or I don't know, I, I, I don't know where 23 year old young men in Germany hang out. But this is the thing, you, uh, you start to ask questions, throw it out there, cast a wide net, 
you might be surprised if one comes back. You might think, oh, well, my target audience never plays free to play games. Your survey results come back. Not only do they play heavily on Steam, but they spend a hundred bucks a month on free to play. And you're like, what? You had no idea. Or maybe they have a particular type of game that they like, but they have a chief complaint. And you see, this is like a common thing. Well, I really loved Hades, but I felt like it was missing X, Y, Z. And if you have like a hundred responses out of 200, you're like, hmm, might be really interesting to add in a feature. So understanding and talking to your players gives you ideas about who they are and how you can cater everything to them. Because guess what? Your brilliant game idea is not about you. That's called art. Your brilliant idea about this game is for the players. That's called a business. Okay. So you really have to distinguish between the two. Um, other things that will help you prioritize is also where you should localize, like what languages should be localized in what order, because you're not going to have the money to do everything. And, you know, this localization tends to require quite a bit of funding and also like what platforms you should develop for. If 2% of the thousand people you surveyed have PS5s, I wouldn't make that a priority. If 77% of them have switched, dang, that's where you want to target. Research is king. So um, some of you may know Josiah Hunt and Josiah is based out of Wellington. And I've been mentoring him for over a year through NZ Code. Um, one of the first things that we did for his brilliant game um, is we did a market research. So I'm actually, I'm going to include a link to this pitch po uh, PowerPoint deck. And it has all of the links in here. And the link at the top is the sample questions that he put together. And some of these include things like, first, it's a statement. Hi, I'm making a 2D dark fantasy RPG. I'd like to get to know you a little bit better. And as a thank you, there'll be a draw for a $10 gift card, or it was like a $50 gift card, whatever. He had, I, well, I, I know that I retweeted it and lots of people retweeted it to help him get that market research. And he had, I, I think he had over a thousand, thousand responses because I think he bumped it up from $10. This was just the draft that we, he and I came up with. Um, he asked things like, what are your game habits? Do you even play uh, action RPGs? Um, here are some of the examples. How interested are you in single player games? Um, what are the things that you love the most? Is it the writing? Is it the graphics? Do you belong to game communities? If not, yes, what are they? So, um, you know, or is it Discord? Do you spend all your time in Discord? Great. Then you know, it's like, oh, 80% of our people are big on Discord. Great. We need to build a Discord community that becomes part of your community engagement strategy. I hope that you're all seeing this. Show of hands if you are. It's like information is king. How many hours a week do you play? What kind of puzzles do you play? What kind of themes? What platforms are you on? Um, so then, you know, I'm actually, this is, um, a user profile that my husband and I put together for our studio, uh, gosh, five years ago, five years ago, we were doing some further market research for a, an accelerator, a tech accelerator that we were in. And we went out and we did the same thing. We're like, Hey, 20 bucks, 50 bucks for some like five, 10 minutes of your time. You'll be an entered in a draw. Cause we wanted to know, would people want to use a simplified game engine for writers? And so I don't know if you can like quite see the full detail. Well, it's small here and it's large on my other screen, but you'll be able to like literally create a fictional, fictitious, fictitious person out of your questions. And that way, when you do your marketing, you can say, oh, Amy spends most of her time on LinkedIn because she's a, she's an educator, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And um, she feels most comfortable when she sees ads on online and social media, very comfortable when people do referrals to her. So if she gets a word of mouth thing, she's more likely to trust it. These are the components that you're building up on your marketing strategy. And you can also start to see, this goes into a little bit more depth than you need for the Kiwi Starter Grant, but like, what are her goals? So because we were doing talking about technology, so her, her technology goals were create a story. Um, she was very motivated by the idea of making games for social change. Some of the frustrations that she had was, I want to be able to work with teams and other software doesn't allow me to do that. 
and, and here are the things that motivate me, right? Your application is due in a week. You're not gonna have time to do all of this, but you do have time to quickly go and create a survey monkey and say, I'll give you 20 bucks, a draw for $20 to get more user research and like get that out there. Like today, tomorrow, you can get a good chunk of answers to at least start challenging your assumptions. So for example, if you're making a 3D puzzler and it's got comedic, comedic mystery elements, great or a dark fantasy RPG with supernatural possums. That's fantastic, but they don't have the same target players. So start to drill down on that. How do you reach them? Well, you need a hype master. And I hope that that is definitely part of your team. I like to say that there's a hacker and a hustler. Every good team has a hacker and a hustler. So your hackers are your people that are doing the, the grunt work your programmers, your artists, the hustler is your marketing person. It's like the chief evangelist. Do -do -do, this thing is really so somebody who understands surveys, right? It can't just be somebody that says, hey, I wanna run your discord or hey, I wanna do your Facebook. It's like, okay, do you understand? So market research is number one. They have to understand competitive analysis. And guess what? This is stuff you can Google and learn. You do not need a, an MBA in marketing in order to be a hype master for a game studio. You can learn this. There's lots of online courses for learning and I've got resources for you at the end as well. Number one is marketing equals engagement. So it's not just social media. You really need to do the research. You need to be following the metrics. And I've actually been tracking my personal brand, like my coaching stuff, my engagement for the last two and a half years, I can tell you exactly the numbers on those things, because I can see what's working, what doesn't work, and I can tweak things to make them more effective. Um, because my consulting work is a business. It's not an art. It's not a hobby. It is something that pays for several other people's salaries. The other thing is that um, this is just a side note. If you, there's Episodes three, six, and nine of my podcast talk about marketing, and it also talks about marketing pitfalls and things that you can get suckered into. So sometimes people are like, I'm a marketing person. Um, <clears throat> make sure that they show you definitive proof that they can do it before you part with your cash. That is all I will say. There is more on the podcast. So how do you get your game seen? I won't spend too much time on this, um, but just to say like, some of the great strategies that are out there is understanding what your brand vibe is. So if some of you have been around for the launch of Boyfriend Dungeon, oh my God, it was funny, irreverent, flirty, definitely wasn't serious and was really super exciting. They also integrated, hey, this is the vision and the mission of our company. So you got to get to know the devs a little bit. And it just adds this feeling of like, we're along for the ride. We have a buy-in with that. Being consistent with your social media posts. Like, listen, you can't just say I'm going to do a tweet a day and expect people to come and fall in love with your game. It is, it is a lot of effort, which is why... Being an indie game is one of the indie dev is one of the hardest things that you'll ever experience because you're constantly having to wear multiple hats. You are the creator, the, you're trying to hustle for money, you're trying to hustle for an audience engagement and all of those things. Okay. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the 10-80-10 rule when it comes to community building. 10% of people, this is, I've been a stand-up comedian for over 15 years, and um, I think it's 17 years now, 10% of the people, they will love you before you open your mouth. They're like, oh my God, hit me, give me your, let, let me open my wallet, let me give you my money. 80%, they're waiting to see. Most of them will be favorable towards you, and 10% would be like, die. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for that, that charming glimpse into your trauma. Um, so think about that and focus on the 10% that already love you because they will become evangelists. They will go out and they will enthusiastically bring people to your community. They will be your champions and leverage their enthusiasm, right? So think about 
where, where do those 10% of people, your diehard fans, where are they? Build a community around them. And when I say diehard, I don't mean rabid. We, we don't want any rabid fans because those are the scary ones. Okay, so we talked about defining your audience. Let's talk a little bit about making what defines your, what makes your game special. And, you know, the underlying is, or at least profitable, because remember how we were talking about, like, how do we make our money back? Um, in the Kiwi Starter Grant application, there are also places where you can do a little bit of research to get a sense of what other people's um, Steam sales were. And, but you can also go and look to see how many downloads that, like, for example, if you're making a mobile game or a tablet oriented game, then you can go and look at the number of downloads that they've had on Apple or Google Play. There's lots of places where you can find research. Benchmarking. Okay, we've all heard the phrase comparison is the thief of joy. It's also a necessary evil for grant applications. So we, Nothing in your life is personal. The sooner you can embrace that little nugget for yourself, your relationships with people aren't personal, your business relationships with people are personal, your engagement with people on social media, nothing is personal, right? Nothing really matters. This grant application is not purple, uh, is not personal. It is not meant to drive you crazy by making you answer questions you don't want to answer. It is meant to have you understand the basics of solid business practices. Research analytics drive key performance indicators. So knowing that you'll be able to plan for your staffing and all of these needs. When you start looking at other studios, you might say, my game is Dark Souls, but better. Okay, cool, cool. I'm, I'm happy for you. That's fantastic. You need to look at when did that game come out? So was there something, was it the first of its kind? What was the thing that made people go, oh my God, this is amazing. What was the feedback about that game? What was the timing of that game? What was the budget of that game? What was the size of that team? You know, all of these things matter. And if you... Sometimes what happens is in our earnestness, um, I used to think we would sell our company for $30 billion. Like, I don't know. I, I was like, $30 billion. Mwah, mwah, mwah. And listen, that is a late 1990s reference to Austin Powers. I'm old. Don't shoot me. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily have the best framework for understanding where we fit in that benchmarking, but you can at least fill out those questions in the Kiwi Starter Grant to, it demonstrates that you understand what other people did to get to be where they are. So this is a mean thing to say to somebody that's like, you think you're special? You actually are. You are. You may have a really great idea for your game. Uh, I was a judge for the Kiwi Starter Prize a couple of years ago and um, got to meet some very hardworking people. And ultimately, it went to the team that had the best business strategy, best attitude. So that was a big thing. So when they narrowed it down to, I think, uh, five contestants or three contestants, we, the judges all got together in person and we were like, okay, this is the, we wanted them to have first prize, second prize, third prize. Um, and it came down to how coachable were they and receptive to what they did not know. So please remember that is we're all looking at your attitude. So if you go into this going, well, they don't know anything because I really am special. I'm like, that's nice, but this is about evolving as a business. So having realistic budgets and timelines, your understanding of how you can convey what's happening in your world, in your game. So like the mechanics and the art style and the world building, how do you talk about your team? All of these things in order to sell, we talked about, wow. 
um, we talked about clarity equals cash. This is about being credible as not just a games person with ideas. It's the clarity and being concise. So you might have a really great idea for your game. Don't go on 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 you need to be like succinct about it because those details aren't going to matter to the judges. They just want you to like drill down what are the essential pieces. The application, if you go through each of the sections, is really quite clear, but it can be overwhelming to somebody who's never looked at ladies before. I'll also share with you that I put in an application. I've done multiple grant applications and one was so frustrating to me. So it was for innovative technologies. I applied once and they said, you were just so close. You were like two more. You were like, didn't quite make it, but the one after that, right? And so they gave you feedback and they said, well, this, this didn't, you didn't answer these questions. And I was like, okay. So I went in, I revised the application for next time. And I'm like, I answered those questions. Fantastic. For sure. We should get the money this time. Put in the application, different set of judges. You were one off from the cutoff. I'm like, mm. um, so, and then the third time was the last time that we could apply and they just had so many good applications. So that's the other thing that I want you to consider is just because you put in an application and you're not successful this time does not mean you should stop. Um, in other cases, we put in multiple applications and we finally got the funding. Um, so it's, it's just, it takes practice. It takes practice. So let's talk a little bit about the SWOT analysis. The application wants you to get very real about your strengths and weaknesses. So experienced biz develop, biz people, so people who've made games and educators and all of that and outside party observers, they can smell stink anywhere. If you are going, and we can make a billion dollars, we are the next Roblox. They'll be like, hmm, and you have no credibility to back that up. That's like, we're going to throw you in the garbage. And, and that just, it literally comes down to inexperience. And it's very humbling being eight years past where I started. Ooh, I, I, that's why I love doing this work <laughs> because I'm trying to share with you, humility is a very good trait to have. Um, so it's okay to not know things, but be honest with the things that your team is really great at. So maybe you've got some people who've got some really like a lot of experience with their game jam. Does their, they won some awards, fantastic. Hype up those awards. Um, it's the one time where awards really matter is in grant applications. Um, also be honest with the things that you're not that strong at. So you could say our weakness is marketing, but we've talked to, you know, this, this, this person, um, you know, try and build a team that rounds you out as a, as, as a project moving forward. Um, and identify opportunities for you to grow as a team, right? It's the Kiwi Starter Prize $25,000 is not going to be the definitive success for you, but you can leverage that into, hey, we were able to spend more time building our vertical slice, which got us to a publisher, right? So those are things for you to consider. There's lots of things that we did not cover, but I wanted to include, and then we're almost wrapping up this portion, but we can have a conversation. So there are some really great articles that I've accumulated over the years. One of which, if you're not following Victoria Tran on Twitter, she is brilliant. And she now has a marketing email letter, um, newsletter. So she used to work for Kit Fox. She's now the community lead for Among Us or Innis Law Games. And she has marketing on a small to no budget. That is a worthwhile article to go and read. And you can even grab some of the concepts there and include them in your application. Um, Stephanie, uh, otherwise known as Maple Thistles, my fellow Canadian and, and uh, game dev bestie, she has some really great resources for community managers that she's put together. Again, those are some strategies that are gonna help you. You don't, none of what you're thinking about doing has is unique or new 
um, in many regards. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to the marketing pieces. There are resources out there. <coughs> Also, um, Chris Wolf has put together a really fantastic YouTube video on the art of the pitch deck. And uh, Josiah used it and put together a really fantastic pitch deck. Um, and he's gotten very positive responses from publishers for his pitch deck. Uh, and then there are a couple of other, there's a great thread by um, Callum from Teddy Robot, Robot Teddy, Robot Teddy on pitching a publisher and there's another article on publishing. So here's the thing. If you are new to this whole grant application thing, or if you are new to being a, the idea of being a business owner, it is totally okay. We all started somewhere. I had never run a business before. I learned the hard way. It was challenging. I had a lot of great things and I had a lot of challenges along the way. That's why I'm saying, like, if you want to go listen to the podcast, it's a very real look at starting your own games business. Um, but asking for help is something that successful people do because they realize that it's less about being seen as I don't have the answers and more about I need to get the answers. So don't make yourself suffer just for um, for fun. Uh listen, you put in this application and you don't, if you're not successful, it's not the end of the world. So um, don't worry too much about that. And this isn't about winning at any age. Now, I just noticed that my next slide has nothing to do with this talk. But if you want to find some interesting stuff on portfolio advice and interviews, <laughs> there is a bonus, uh, a bonus document there and how to grow your network. And that also has links to some Discord channels for game developers and stuff. So it's a really good link to, um, to help round out your stuff as a game developer. And you can find my contact information on this last page. So I'm going to wrap up this portion of the talk and then I'm, I'm here to answer questions and, and to share a little bit of my struggles and successes and let's go on the ammo. Stop sharing. Ta -da. Dean, Dean, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Um, now, so I we saw do... that there were some chat questions. Uh, yeah, there was a, someone was looking for a link to your podcast. So I dropped that in there. Thank you. No problem. Um, so from, uh, there's a couple things that I wanted to touch on that uh, from the NZGDA standpoint. Uh, first off, like um, you were talking about using the Kiwi Game Starter as leverage. Uh, and I think that's a really relevant thing to consider. Uh, like again, the, the, the prize money isn't necessarily gonna, gonna carry your game. Um, but what it does do is that it demonstrates uh, even just winning the competition demonstrates a validity um, that you can leverage. So for example, Balancing Monkey with their um, the game Before We Leave. So they were, they were Kiwi Game Starter winners um, yeah. and they, they leveraged it and they were able to say, you know what, we won this competition and take that information over to Epic, take that information to a whole bunch of other places. And they raised a ton more money um, mm -hmm. piggybacking on the KGS. So it's not necessarily the end uh, of, of where you can take KGS. It's, it's effectively only really just the start. Um, yeah. so I think that that's I was so, I'll say to you, Lucas, I, I was, that was, that was the competition the year that I judged uh -huh. and, and a big part of it was their willingness to, to grow as business owners because they understood it's not just a game. This is like, we've got to build this to scale it, to sell it. And, and it shows in everything that they've done since they really listened. Yep. So I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. I think the other thing is that you mentioned how uh, with a lot of venture capital, there's, a, there's an expectation of ROI of return on investment. Um, and that with places like uh, NZ Code and the Kiwi Game Start competition, there isn't necessarily that, that idea of return on investment. Um, I, would, I would argue that there kind of is, but it's sort of abstracted out. Uh, for both of like both for ANSA GDA um, and for um, New Zealand Code, uh, the return on investment for us is successful New Zealand game companies. Uh, that's ultimately that's the investment that that we are doing. 
Um, so we are going to be, uh, or the judges are going to be picking um, or selecting, uh, you know, the winners based upon their ability to become soluble and contributing members of uh, the game community here in New Zealand. Um, you know, so it's the idea of a rising tide lifts all ships. Um, we want more successful game companies in our in in our industry here in New Zealand, um, and so that is the return on investment for 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 a lot of these um, grant style applications. Uh, and I, that's see just that Ella, I see that Ella has a question. What are the best approaches for setting up market surveys when you're starting from nothing? Um, I'm going to shoot over the link to Lucas for the talk so that you have the link to that particular slide and Josiah's sample questions. And like, honestly, I, I would be happy to retweet out your survey if you want to uh, send me a DM on Twitter and say, hey, Jean, thanks for the talk. I have this survey. Can you tweet it out? I got 9,000 followers. People will retweet it. Like everybody wants you to succeed. So first is looking at that application and seeing what are the things that you need to know about or taking from Josiah's example. Also include, I think he still has his survey monkey thing up. So you'll be able to see some of his questions and then formulate your own. And then just ask people to retweet it. And you don't always have to offer uh, a 10 or $20 gift card. Like that's a nice thing that you can do, but a lot of people are willing to help out indie devs if you're just asking for two to five minutes of their time. So ask people that are in your network to share out that market survey and get that research going. And uh, from my standpoint, a lot of the times that um, with applications, with um, putting out requests for uh, surveys, um, what a lot of people feel uncomfortable doing is, is getting that call to action is being really explicit as to this is what I would like you to do. Um, and this is true for doing any sort of pitches, you know, at the end, you have to be really clear, like we are looking for money, we are looking for this. In this particular instance, make sure you say like, please retweet this, please answer, but please retweet this, get this out as much as possible. Don't be cagey about it, just get it out there. Clarity equals cash, Lucas. <laughs> Are there any further questions yeah. that we might be able to handle? Oh, I see Jeremy typing. He's either sending, you know, a tweet. Who knows? Might be easier to just say. Um, I was just wondering if you had any recommendations for um, predicting sort of accurate values for um, like projected costs. Oh, goodness. Um, Lucas, do you all have sample budgets for your applications? So we actually, we, we considered that uh, this year, um, but ultimately what, what we're looking for um, would be those people who are able to, it's kind of a dick move, but we are like, well, we, we wanna see people um, be able to find that without being spoon fed. Um, so to answer, to Gene, to answer your question, uh, in terms of do we have sample stuff, uh, we are not providing sample stuff this year, but we may reconsider that for next year. Um, so here's, here's what I'm going to say. I hope you will reconsider it for next year. Okay. Because I think back to eight years ago when we were getting started, the only person on our team that had games industry experience was my husband. He was eight years at EA and Zynga. And, and the rest of us were just like, we're along for the ride. And you're going to find that with a lot of people who are applying for the Indie Starter Grants is that they are woefully inexperienced and they don't know about budgeting and scheduling and doing all these things. So Jeremy, I would say your fastest path to cash, the easiest answer, go look at the NZ code application. I'm pretty sure they have a sample budget in there. Um, and also you can do some research like the GDC vault has on YouTube has tons of free resources on how do you make a production plan and I have another talk that I give about this one game that we made that went horribly wrong and four years later, it's still not made, but it's going to get made in 2023. And it's amazing how 
we did not build a production plan from the get-go and that was part of the problem so having that clarity of like this is how long this component's going to take this component you're going to need to learn these skills and you could learn those skills in a overly priced educational setting um or you can just go to the gdc vault learn them apply them go talk to mentors like v pendergrass at co nz code is phenomenal love v to it to the moon and back uh there are tons of people who want to give you their expertise but please google that stuff because there's some good stuff out there so ella has a question what is something you think stands out when applying for these sorts of funding applications, grants and publishers? Well, I mean, I think the, the team makeup. So everybody seems, everybody uh, in air quotes, we all know that our industry skews towards certain demographic, especially the publishing bodies that are in the United States that feels like culturally it's taken over the whole world, but that is starting to shift. Um, if you have a team that is diverse, there are funds specifically looking for diverse creators. If you have a story that is interesting and different, um, if you have mechanics that are fun and sticky, if you have a visual style that is compelling, or maybe you're doing something that's never been done before. So in our case, we thought we made a pretty compelling case for a business argument. Um, we just we just really sucked at the marketing thing eight years ago. But we've partnered with Charlene Harris, who wrote the True Blood series. So she had the series True Blood on HBO ages and ages ago. She's had multiple TV shows made out of her novels. Uh, not the novel that we have the rights to. And we thought, and she had like a million downloads of her last game for sure. That would make for a compelling argument that we deserve grant money. No, no. So you still need to do all of the other things, like something that stands out, a really slick vertical slice. And, and if you, you unfortunately may not have the, the resources, the time, and resources to be able to put together a vertical slice in the period of time that you would like, because maybe you're working full time. Maybe you're stressed out by supporting a family. Unfortunately, that's just the reality that people who have the resources of time are going to be more fortunate to be able to put together things like that. So those are, I would say vertical slice, community engagement, Maybe you're a freaking star on TikTok. And um, I've seen some people uh, see a massive uptick in their game from their TikTok stuff. So there's lots of stuff out there. Mm. Um, Jean, can I jump in there real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to, to, for Ella's question, from, from, the, uh, from the KGS standpoint, from the, from the Kiwi Game Star standpoint, um, like it is a business development grant. It is not an artistic grant. Uh, so we are definitely looking for those um, applications that can demonstrate um, the potential for a solid business, for continued, continued growth uh, and stability. Um, so what, um, what we saw last year was that there are several sort of tiers of, of applications. Um, and the first tier were those that you know maybe had a game but definitely did not have their act together when it came to it to, to being able to communicate the strength of their business um, and those were very quickly sort of you know uh not considered um then there was there, then there were those, those those teams that had a strong business model had a, a a game that that had legs um but and this is part of the process is that there's actually a communication that happens with the finalist judges um and they did not demonstrate a willingness to listen to what the judges were telling them and to act on the on on what the judges were. So it's it's this ability to to uh, hear uh, and assess and comprehend outside input. Um, and it was it was it was the teams that were able to not only demonstrate a good game, demonstrate good business, but also to be able to bring on board everything that the, the judges were telling them and talking to them about and have a willingness to listen that really brought those teams um, to the top. 
I'll polish is a vertical slice. Uh, I think Brogan, uh, Lucas has just answered your question. It is the marketing plan is going to be really important and being able to define your audience and your, your plan to be able to put this together and how are you going to use that $25,000. I will say the vertical slice needs to be polished when you go after publishers and that pitch deck needs to be super clear. So those resources at the end of this talk are going to help you with that. Um, relevant competitors doing competitive analysis. Okay. God, I, I don't know what, again, inexperience is what possessed me to be like, wow, look, my craft was sold for $3 billion. Our idea is way better. <laughs> so it should be worth $30 billion. Yeah. Okay. So those things don't happen. Don't benchmark yourself against the the very top creme de la creme. Like if you're like, we're going to be Call of Duty, but better. Do you know how much money the Call of Duty makes every single day? It is the number one game franchise on the planet other than I think Minecraft and Roblox. So you need to find yourself a couple of different points of comparison. You know, think about the size of your team and say, okay, well, this other indie team that had this size and this development period, like what, what are their, what's their audience like? So um, I feel like that's a vague answer, but at the same time, what do you think, Lucas? So I would say, um, I would say there's sort of two different, um, two different comparisons that you might want to give for your application, right? So there's, there's sort of a gameplay comparison and then there's your competitor comparison. So the game, you might say, this is like Call of Duty, but X. But um, to be honest, if someone said Call of Duty is our competitor, uh, then, then that would probably be looked at with the side eye for sure, because Call of Duty is not your competitor. Um, so take a look at what other... Um, companies that are out there that not, aren't necessarily making the exact same game, but are making the same target, are making games that hit the same target audience uh, and, and try to compare to them, so, like see how many people, see how many employees they have, uh, see what kind of um, community engagement they use. Um, and, and so, you know, you can compare it to, you can compare it like that, like, you know, you, um, you're able to contextualize how you imagine your company to operate within the sphere that we're in, right? Um, so, you know, you might even say like to take some local examples, like it's probably too late to say you're like Dinosaur Polo Club. Uh, like DBC started off as two people. Um, and, you know, at that time you probably said like, we, we, we're doing DPC type of stuff. But nowadays, you know, they're a little bit too big for what, for what you are gonna be trying to aim for necessarily with this application. Um, but there are plenty of other companies out there that are smaller and, and they're doing some really significant stuff. Um, so you might want to take a look at that just in terms of competitive uh, for a similar market, as opposed to this is the type of game we want to look at, it, that, that type, type of game we want to make. So just keep in mind that there's those two different types of comparisons that you can do. You can do like a gameplay or aesthetic comparison, but you can also do a competitive comparison, which is looking more at how you engage with your target audience or overlaps of target audiences. Ella, you mentioned there being bad marketing teams, you know, good ones. Um, that's always a tricky thing for anybody to talk about because I don't know what other people's experiences are. Um, I will say that one company that I've seen that has done consistently decent, question mark, is Evolve PR. They're based out of Canada. Um, I have known several friends that have worked there for a period of time who still work there. And, and so they do consistently good work. If you end up going into uh, and hiring a PR or marketing company at some point, just make sure you're checking out their statistics and their, their user acquisition numbers and their monetary. Like if somebody ever says to you, I'm a marketing person, but can't show you definitive proof or testimonials, God, I wish I just ran away. I have thrown over $20,000 on marketing people because I didn't know. I just assumed when somebody said they were a consultant of X that they knew more than me. And it was, we won't even go there. We won't even go there. So what you need to understand is you're not going to have expertise in everything and you're not going to necessarily know who are the best people to hire, but go and ask people who, 
you know, come back and ask me on Twitter and I'll ask around. I could even put a tweet out and say, hey, who are some of the best PR companies out there, the best marketing teams out there? Or um, is anybody open for freelance marketing roles? And there'll be tons of responses. So there are some really great people out there. And then the next thing is learning to spot the difference between somebody who says they're a good hype person and another person who has delivered those results. Is it also worth mentioning unsuccessful games with our thoughts on why it failed? Hmm. Um, hmm. I, I would say no, uh, at, at least for KGS, principally because we want to see you succeed. Um, and whereas there's an infinite number of reasons why a company will fail, uh, and you might have opinions about that, there's very few reasons for why a company can will succeed. Um, and so we want you to be thinking, we want you to be modeling your work after those companies that have succeeded, I guess, would be my guess, would be my approach. Again, I'm not, I'm not a judge. Uh, I'm just helping to coordinate. Uh, so you, your judges might have different opinions, but I, I would probably say stick to, stick to success stories. And take their failures, of which there are many out there, and leverage those to understand what didn't work. I mean, one of the reasons why our game got delayed and then almost tanked is at the last minute, one of our investors pulled out and that was the money we needed for the last six months of the game. And all of a sudden we just lost a six month runway and we floundered and we did our best and it nearly took the company down. And if you listen to the podcast, you will hear that we were so hung on to this iceberg that is one more story games that we became homeless three years ago. So like, in, this is a crazy journey that you wanna go on. If you've got the stomach for the journey, cool. It's a cool journey. It's all about the learning and you are going to make mistakes as you go along. Be open to making those mistakes. Even if you said, these are, these are successful games that I'm gonna be like them, that doesn't guarantee that you're gonna be a success but pick up on the things that they did right. What do you think about the idea of um, how you mentioned applying um, in the sense of selling yourself as someone that can grow, um, applying for funding or grants to be able to create a more elaborate vertical slice. So say you've got like a small vertical slice, like a very small one. Um, do you think it's worth mentioning in your application that you're looking to create like a bigger one to be able to then seek further funding or publishers, et cetera? Um, or do you think you should more approach it from the point of view of this is our prototype and we're looking to make a full game? Especially think, for like smaller grants like the Kiwi Games data or something like that. I know that my headphones are gonna die. <clears throat> Hopefully this will work, but we'll see. Um, so I, if my understanding is correct, then what I can say is that <clears throat> NZ Code does have funding for the like different stages of your business. So there's like, and I know that they have that here in Canada, they have something that is uh, what they call the pre-production grant. So they're literally just giving you money to try out the feasibility. Like, is this even feasible? Because that's the piece that's missing. We, all of the ecosystems across the world, we need to have that feasibility research that's like the beginning of your vertical slice before we move into the production grants. So yeah, check out NZ Code. I don't know what else is you know available in your side of the world, but I do love the fact that the New Zealand government has been putting a lot more money into these programs. And, um, and that's all exciting for each and every one of us. They could always put more, right? What's that? Um, they could always put more money in for sure. Yes. Yes. Um, so Jeremy, I would, I would argue that, uh, you know, the KGS award, maybe you could carry one employee for four months effectively. Um, so it's not, it's not going to make your game. Uh, and I think that the, the understanding is that it, that, that award won't necessarily make your game. Um, so I, I don't think it would necessarily be a bad thing to say, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna use this money to leverage to, to keep developing this and get it in front of other publishers. Like that's ultimately the goal that I think NZGDA would want would be successful published games. Uh, so if you're able to use the funds to then pivot to something that does get published by someone else, more power to you.
Well, that takes us to 1.30. Um, if you guys have any more questions, uh, I can be reached at, uh, I think it's just KGS at nzgda.com. Um, Jean, you've got your Twitter. Yes, you can reach me. My Twitter is at Jean Leggett. And I am going to email Lucas a copy of my presentation so that you all have that. And, and it was a pleasure. Good luck with your application. And um, last plug for my podcast, but honestly, it really is the, the real look at the, the highs and lows of being an indie game starter, because welcome to running a business. It is no longer just about art that you want to pursue, but it's about the monetization of your brilliant ideas. And uh, we have faith in you. All right. Um, let us know uh, if we can help out in any other way. Um, otherwise, good luck with your applications. Um, zing over any questions that you have for me. Uh, and um, Godspeed. Uh, podcast is called Games, Grit, and Gratitude. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you, Gene. And we'll talk to you later. Take care. Bye. Bye.